Hello and let's talk about whether COVID-19 is airborne. There's been a lot of concern about this issue that's the airborne spread of the disease over the past few days. When we say airborne, we are talking about the possibility of the disease spreading through smaller particles called aerosols, which can linger in the air for much longer after they're discharged from the nose or mouth of an infected person. The current belief is that the disease largely spreads through bigger particles, which sink to the ground faster and are not likely to linger in the air for very long. This was published in the Clinical Infectious Diseases Journal with the title, It is Time to Address the Airborne Transmission of COVID-19. The WHO has until now focused more on the role of the big particles and a lot of the safety measures we have been told to take. For instance, keeping a two-foot distance, washing our hands with soap after touching surfaces are based on that model. Now, the WHO has acknowledged that there is evidence emerging of the spread through smaller particles as well. This is also important considering how, say, air conditioning could play a role in the spread of the smaller particles. If the airborne spread of COVID-19 is established as a major factor, we could be seeing the need for an additional set of precautions as well. Newsclicks Prabir Purkaisa so spoke to Dr. Satyajit Rath and discussed what these new developments mean. Satyajit, recently, uh, one issue that has come up is that a lot of the COVID-19 infections are airborne, not just to what are called big particles, which are easier to stop and so on, but to what is called aerosol, small droplets, which stay in the air, can float for a much longer time, do not drop to the ground very rapidly, and also operates through the what's called the air conditioning and ventilation system, which can therefore affect large buildings, where a lot of this actually are sort of shared through the air conditioning system. So the virus can spread to the air conditioning system if a number of people are in a uh, closed hall, even if the hall is large, which is large gatherings, this seems to have an effect. So do you think the aerosol issue is really uh, something which we should take much more seriously now? Okay, so um, this is obviously um, exploded into the media and public discourse over these past three days or so, ever since um, a a couple of Australian authors, I think, uh, um, led a 200 plus researcher letter to clinical infectious disease. Um, uh, suggesting that we, suggesting more accurately rather than we, that the WHO should be much more focused on the aerosol issue than the WHO has been so far. WHO has been more or less denying that aerosol is a major cause of concern and is really focusing on droplets and surface contamination through droplets. So to be fair to the WHO, the WHO has not actually denied that aerosols are an issue. The WHO has simply said that the evidence with regard to aerosol, as far as the WHO's own technical committee is concerned, is somewhat equivocal at the moment and therefore they are not taking a position on it in formal recommendation terms. So, um, but let me let me get uh, both ourselves and uh, our uh, listeners to step back a little. You see, the fact of the matter is that the virus spreads from one airway to another airway. The way it will spread is that the airway will put out virus in droplets of a whole variety of dimensions. When of you the say droplet. airways, you mean the human being? Who's oh, Airways of the human beings, well, presumably airways of the bats as well, but that's a couple of years ago, so let's not worry too much about that anymore. But the reality is that you're going to have all manner of spread to be statistically possible. Whether it is through large droplets, small droplets, whether it is through droplets directly inhaled or droplets fallen on some surface and then transferred by my touching the surface and then my touching my nose. These are all just variations on the theme. So the first thing we we must remember is that this is not some completely different method of transmission. These are all just variations on the theme. The second point is none of this has a breakpoint. You know, everybody talks about Dogas Duri, the two meter distancing. But the two meter distancing is not because 
transmission is remains exactly the same whether you are 2 inches away or go uh, gaz away and then when you are 2 inches beyond 2 meters away transmission falls to zero that's not the case although when we speak about this in public discourse and we say oh you know keep 2 meter distances we begin to make it sound inadvertently as though that is the case and i think this is a good time to remind ourselves that as you go further and further away from each other there is a gradual decay in the likelihood that infection will reach that's because well, actually much larger volume will take place you draw a sort of hemisphere around you so the volume reduces for you in terms of your ingestion the further away you go but it's also that's 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 one point the uh, the other side of that is that when i sneeze there are very large droplets which don't even travel 6 inches then there are smaller ones and smaller ones and smaller ones there is a whole distribution also so, so you are always going to have some likelihood the real question about recommendations of a cut off kind is at what point do you recommend the cut off and that point needs to exclude a lot of possibility and yet be practicable that's always going to be a shifting zone so we need to keep the reality of this continuum in mind rather than getting head up about are you 3 inches on my side of the 2 uh, meters or 4 uh, centimeters on your side exactly similarly think about the aerosol problem now in context because what we now have is do aerosols matter now if you are in the marketplace in india where you are buying vegetables from uh, outdoor vendors and somebody sneezes there is an aerosol but the aerosol dissipates in the open air and uh, in all likelihood never achieves enough concentration to manage very strong transmission does this mean that nobody will get trans infected not at all let me interrupt it for a second so the issue is one is of course that the transmission itself takes place the second is what is the concentration which you ingest so to say through your air base well, by yes. your breathing and so therefore the degree of dilution in open and closed spaces could be very different number one add to that the uh, basic energy saving uh, pattern in air conditioning where air is a substantial proportion of the air is recycled correct which then exposes you over and over again now keep something else in mind it's true that large droplets don't travel very far but because the droplet is large there will be many more virus particles in the droplet yes. it's true that a small aerosol droplet will travel far but individual aerosol droplets will inevitably have fewer viruses so there are there are these trade off continuums all around in a variety of ways so the question here is not is a aerosol transmission possible of course it's possible the question here is not should we worry or not worry about aerosol transmission of course we should consider aerosol transmission just as much as we should consider surface mediated indirect transmission the question here is what are the practical situations and strategies to function as advice with specific reference to aerosols that's really the issue and that context closed door crowded recirculating air air conditioning is always going to be an issue the um, uh, restaurant example of major outbreak that is commonly used is in fact a classic example where under air and air air conditioner uh, um, outlet there were three tables and people at all three tables got infected but remember that nobody else in the large room got infected so it's essentially a matter of people getting exposed to aerosol over and over again is this an impossibility no not at all should we be concerned about this absolutely yes should we be aware of the specific situation in which 
aerosol transmission becomes a likelihood, a high likelihood hazard that we should do something about, that's the point that we should keep. In our next segment, we bring you an interview with Palestinian lawyer and activist Diana Butu. She explains what's happening with Israel's annexation plan of large parts of the occupied West Bank and the Jordan Valley. The plan was supposed to be implemented on July 1st, but it seems to have been postponed. Diana Butu talks about the continuing nature of the occupation and oppression and explains the death of the two-state solution. I think it's important to first uh, keep in mind that there was nothing sacred or special about July the 1st. Uh, that was listed as the first date that they could begin annexation. And uh, the way that they were going to begin annexation was through one of two methods. One was to either put forward a law into the, the, the Knesset, the parliament, or through um, a cabinet bill doing the same. And the reason that July 1st was the date that was specified was that this was the date that was spelled out in the agreement between Netanyahu and uh, his once rival, who then became his ally, Benny Gantz, as being the first date that such legislation could be introduced. So we don't know if, um, if things are on hold. We don't know what the shape of annexation looks like. What we do know is that it hasn't been called off. There hasn't been a statement by Netanyahu backing off of it. We haven't heard Gantz back down from it either. In fact, all that we've been hearing is that uh, they haven't yet put forward the details of it, in large part because we are now here experiencing a second wave um, when it comes to the spread of the coronavirus. And this particular government was a government that was enacted only to address the coronavirus, with one exception, and that is annexation. So I don't suspect that things are going to be canceled. In fact, I just suspect that it's going to be somewhat delayed until uh, a little bit of a later time, but certainly no later than when the U.S. elections take place. That's what I, that's what I predict. Right. So uh, to take maybe a step backwards, something you and many other commentators have pointed out, of course, is that annexation per se is not something new. It's, this is not any new thing. It's been happening for decades. We've seen, for instance, the demolition of houses, the takeover of lands. We've seen a lot of other atrocities. We've also seen steps like the building of the apartheid wall, for instance, which in many ways basically uh, create the structure for that. But even so, in that sense, how do you see the, uh, this uh, move marking, for instance, a new phase in the occupation uh, that is taking place right now? Over the course of the past 53 years, we have seen two different approaches take place when it comes to the occupation. The first approach, which has um, been the approach that the, we've seen over the course of the, the majority of the years, has been what's called the quiet approach, or what others have termed creeping annexation or de facto annexation. And in that system, what's done is that we've already seen the measures of annexation on the ground, but it's been done quietly. So we've seen the construction of 130 settlements. We've seen that there are now 700,000 Israeli settlers, which just to put it in perspective, that's 25% uh, of the population of the West Bank. We've seen that uh, checkpoints, there's nearly 700 checkpoints and roadblocks in place in the, in the West Bank. We've seen the construction of the wall. We've seen land confiscation. We've seen home demolitions. Um, We've seen settler violence. These are all measures that have been undertaken now for 53 years. The difference between that and the other approach, which is the loud approach, is that in the past, while it was all done very quietly, along comes Netanyahu who says, I'm not gonna do things quietly any longer, and I'm going to be bold, and I'm going to be in your face about it, and watch, I wanna see if the world's gonna stop me. And so it's important to keep in mind that in 2018, when Israel passed um, a law that was called the Jewish Nation State Law, which is a law that privileges Israel's Jewish citizens over its non-Jewish citizens, it's a Jewish supremacy law in effect, again, he didn't have to do that uh, because the, the Israeli Supreme Court was already on side with everything that the government had been doing, and it had already instituted this measure of Jewish supremacy. The difference was is that he wanted to be loud about it, and he wanted to be bold, and he wanted to see if the world would stop him, and they didn't. And so too, when it comes to this current phase of annexation, 
all that he is doing is he is saying to the world, I want to see if you're going to stop me. It formalizes the system of apartheid as we already know it. And the only thing that makes it different is that now he's saying to the world, I'm going to institute apartheid and I want to see if you are going to stop me. On the ground, it may not change a lot. There will be some changes and I don't want to undermine those. Um, I do believe that, the, that this move will embolden the Israeli settler movement. It will allow the settlers to go and attack Palestinians with a lot more um, freedom. I think that it's also going to embolden the settlers to build and expand more settlements. I think that it's also going to embolden the Israeli government to demolish more Palestinian homes. And I think it's going to embolden the Israeli government to try to get rid of as many Palestinians as possible. So I don't want to say that there's no, um, no substantive difference between pre-annexation and post-annexation, but the difference in the minds of the Israeli government, the reason that this is being done now is because he can. Right. So uh, this, of course, has a lot to do with Trump's uh, so-called deal of the century itself. A lot of the Netanyahu's annexation plan is very closely connected to Trump's plan as well. But uh, let's take this question also to that of the two-state solution. Now, we know that the two-state solution has basically been, has virtually been dead for quite some time. There's been talk of it, but clearly the situation on the ground is completely changed. So what does this annexation plan do to this two-state solution? The two-state solution died the minute that the Israelis were unwilling to uproot any settlers. And, uh, and sadly, that was in 1968. Right. Um, and, and so we've been living since that time with this myth that somehow Israel is going to end the settlement enterprise, that it's going to mm -hmm. withdraw the settlers, that it's going to end its colonial rule. And we know that it won't. Mm -hmm. The difference between, between that position and what's happening now is that while we Palestinians have known this for quite some time and have been articulating this for many, many years, this is now the first time that the international community is realizing the death of the two-state solution, which is why they're pushing back so hard mm -hmm. on this issue of annexation. Is right. the, the issue of annexation, formal annexation, does two things to the, um, the international community. It forces them to reconcile with the fact that there is not going to be a two-state settlement, and it forces them to reconcile with the fact that there is no peace process. And given that this is uh, where the state of affairs is, it requires that they actually, actually put into place measures to stop annexation. But we've known for, for 53 years that Israel will never withdraw or evacuate its settlements. Right. That's all we have in this episode. Let's talk. We'll be back tomorrow with major news developments from the country. Until then, keep watching NewsClick. Thank you.